Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight for Bible study. God makes everything beautiful in his own timing. Our scripture tonight will come from 1 Samuel 16, verse number 7, from the New King James Version, and it reads, for the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. On my 7.30 a.m. morning prayer line this morning, my brother read a devotional reading that he had received from Pastor Joel Osteen, and I want to share that with you. The reading was entitled, Promotion. God doesn't choose the way people choose. People look on the outside. God looks on the heart. God knew that if he could trust David to take care of sheep and to be faithful when things weren't going his way, he could trust him to take care of his people. David went from being a shepherd to being the next king. Nobody voted for him. This wasn't a democracy. If there had been an election, David would not have received one vote because nobody in Israel knew who he was at that time. His father didn't even believe in him. It goes on to say that when God is ready to promote you, he doesn't take a vote. God doesn't check to see who likes you who's for you, or how popular you are. It's not a vote. It's an appointment. Promotion does not come from people. It comes from God. When it's your time to be promoted, no person, no bad break, no disappointment, and no enemy can stop you. God has the one and only vote he has the final say. Aren't you glad that God does not see people as other people see us? Aren't you glad that God sees our heart and our faithfulness? I thank God that promotions come from him. And I'm so thankful that God has the final say. We know that our timing is not God's timing. In God's own timing. He makes all things, all things beautiful and all things right if we just continue to put our trust in Him, in His time. In His time, in His time, He makes all things beautiful. Just what you say in your time. 
Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus of Christ, we come. Lord, we glorify you, we magnify you, we thank you for another privilege. Thank you for another honor, Father God, to come before you. Now, Lord God, we realize that you are God, you are holy, you blessed us again, given us another chance. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that as we look into your word, that you will speak clearly to us, that you will receive the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. He, he has perfect timing, and we need to meet him in his timing as he meet us where we are. I'm calling your attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Tonight we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're moving right along in 1 Thessalonians, so please, ma'am, please, sir, go ahead and read chapter 3. So you will be prepared to hear what the Lord has to say. A very short chapter. Only three to four pericopes that we will cover in chapter three. So please, ma'am, please, sir, go ahead and read 1 Thessalonians chapter three. We're in chapter three tonight, and Paul has, has ended chapter two, reminding the church at Thessalonica that he was longing, yearning for them. He was longing to be with them. He was longing to be uh, beside them in ministry. But they faced great opposition. And it was the devil, Satan, Lucifer, the, the accuser of the brethren, the devil himself that hindered them. So he was longing to be with them. When we pick up in chapter 3, we will find that the apostle Paul still talks about this longing and this this affliction that was upon them and, and how he, Timothy, as well as Sidus, Silas, was looking forward to seeing them and being a part of them. So please, ma'am, please, sir, look, brothers and sisters, if you would, deeply into this word so you can know some facts about your Christian walk. The same problems that they had in their Christian walk the devil manifests himself even in the 21st century and threatens our Christian law. Let's look here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. The Apostle Paul talks about these afflictions. And uh, in other places, he says that these are very light afflictions. Now, these afflictions that were taking place was brought upon by the devil and by the devil's imps, as well as those who the devil was able to use. You see, Christianity was spreading like wildfire, but there were those who were of the other faiths that was looking to hinder the spread of the Christian doctrine. So let's look and see. Paul says that we thought that it would be good for us to be left in Athens alone. What is he talking about here? Uh, he says, therefore, we could no longer, uh, uh, no longer uh, suffer, no longer endure these afflictions. It gets to a point in all of our lives when we we get uh, go through so much suffering and that we just cannot bear it any longer. The Apostle Paul says, when it got to that point. We just wanted to go ahead and reside in Athens. Let's see the course that he took, the pattern, the, the map that he took to get there. When, when he was forced out of Thessalonica, Paul was forced out of Thessalonica, and Silas went with him. He ended up in Berea, Berea, B-E-R-E-A. He moved from Thessalonica to Berea. And when he got there, and this we, we realize now today that this is just west of Thessalonica. He moved from one city to the next. If if you're in Houston, he moved to Pearland. If if you're in Houston, he 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 moved to Missouri City. If you're in Houston, he 
he moved right west, just just west. He moved to Katy. If, if you're in Houston, he moved to Katy in this this point. He moved to the next town over, or he moved to to Bel Air. He moved to West University. Paul moved because of these afflictions, because people did not like the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me just share with you today. There, even today, are people who do not appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ being spread. I never will forget the year was 1997 uh, that uh, I was a part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Ministry. And we threw an annual banquet where fundraisers all over the world would come and donate money to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which is a Christian organization that deals with athletes and all those that those athletes impact and affect, which means it deals with their family members, their friends, their classmates. And Fellowship of Christian Athletes, they sponsor Bible studies on campus. And because it is led by the students and they have a chaperone, which is a coach usually, uh, it, it was able, we were able to participate with it. So annually, we would have this banquet where thousands of dollars were given right here in the Houston area to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So one of the football players for the Houston Oilers was standing, and he was emceeing. And as he began to take the program from one point to the other, he would interject his appreciation for Jesus Christ. He would talk about Jesus as he moved from one point to the other. He would talk about Jesus. It is a banquet for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Donors are in this room, and these donors are from very different faiths, various different faiths. Little that we knew that there would be somebody in the audience that was offended by the athlete mentioning Jesus Christ name over and over again. They were offended. They called the office of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Monday morning and said, we are removing all of our funding from the Houston area Fellowship of Christian Athletes because your MC, which was a professional football player, he kept mentioning the name of Jesus the whole time we were there. Now, they attended a banquet for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. The word Christian means Christ. The word Christian means like Jesus Christ. The word Christian means as Jesus Christ. The word Christian means Christ-like. The word Christian means Jesus, a person that's like Jesus. So these donors have decided that they want, they're going to pull their funding away from the fellowship of Christian athletes. And as members of the staff, we met that morning and we had a discussion about it. And thank God for the director. Mike said, we are Christians. Mm -hmm. We have to mention Christ Jesus. And if that group wants to pull their funding, we have to go it alone if we have to. Yes. Persecution was real. Mm -hmm. As a board, as a staff, we had to decide that day, that moment, whether we're going to be the fellowship of Christian athletes or are we going to be athletes that say we love Jesus when we really don't. Mm -hmm. Thank God for Mike Myers. Mike Myers stood up that day. And Mike Myers, the director of the Houston Area Fellowship of Christian Athletes, he said, we are going to remember, we are going to recite, we are going to live like Jesus Christ. And thank you for standing with me for Jesus. Yes. Don't you know that funding may have stopped from that particular group, but God is always able to raise up a group yes. that will fund your ministry, 
regardless of who drops out. Mike Meyer says, no, we're not going back down. We're not going to apologize. I appreciate this athlete standing and, and calling out the name of Jesus. And he went on to say, it is power in the name Jesus. I was glad to be a part of that staff. I was glad to be a, a member that will go into the schools and teach for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Because even in the midst of opposition, the director says, we're going to stand for Jesus. Oh, that's a powerful statement. Because there are many Christians all over this land who is giving up their convictions because of opposition. Let me tell you, if you can't stand for Jesus, you have to question yourself. The Apostle Paul here says, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. So Paul moved from Thessalonica to Berea, just west of Thessalonica. He moved, and then the Jews in Thessalonica, who opposed him while he was in Thessalonica, Historians believe that these same Jews that opposed him when he was in Thessalonica, they came over to Berea, hounding him and setting up opposition also. Let me tell you, once you're on the run, you may have to stay on the run. But wherever you go, wherever you run, you need to make sure you take Jesus with you. Make sure you hear from Jesus because the good news is, as, it, as we see here, we also see it with the early church. Wherever they went, Jesus would spread it. The gospel of Jesus Christ went with them. Even though they were running from afflictions, they were spreading the good news of Jesus. What afflictions you have? What sufferings do you have? Are you carrying Jesus throughout the world as you go? Paul says, we couldn't endure it any longer. Our lives were at stake. So we moved. So how did they get to Athens? They went from Thessalonica to Berea. And then the, Jew, the Jews in Athens came over to Berea. And when they got there, they stirred up some stuff that was called opposition. They stirred up oppositions. So Paul's friends escorted him just south down near Galveston, if you're in Houston. <laughs> he escorted him to Athens. At that point, Paul calls for Timothy and Silas to come and join him, but he moved before they got there. He moved to Corinth. Let me tell you, when you're living for the Lord, you're going to have opposition. When you're walking for Jesus, you're going to run into some suffering problems. Wherever we go, there will be some opposition. But you remember, wherever you go, you take Jesus with you and make sure the gospel of Jesus Christ spreads wherever you go. That's why I tell people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what church you're a member of. You make sure that Jesus is there. And you make sure if Jesus wasn't there before you got there, you make sure you bring the gospel of Jesus Christ there. Regardless of what job you're on, regardless of, of where you live, regardless of what neighborhood, you make sure you take Jesus with you. Matter of fact, make sure Jesus is leading you along the way. He says we couldn't take it anymore. We couldn't stand it anymore. So we decided we're going to go to, to Athens. Verse number two says, and sent Peter, meaning we sent, I mean, Timothy, and sent Timothy, our brother. He describes who Timothy is. First of all, Timothy is born again. Timothy is saved. Timothy is our brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Timothy is saved, we have confidence in him. How do you know that? Because the next verse says, he's a minister of God. We sent Timothy, a minister of God, 
one who is a servant. The word, the word minister here means servant. See, you are a brother in Christ Jesus if you're born again and you're saved. But there are a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus that are not ministers of God. And this word minister means a servant. Many times we are saved, but we are not serving. It's kind of like the tree that's planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit and its season. If you are saved, you ought to bring forth fruit in your season. If you're still breathing, you're in your season. You know, I know there are certain denominations and certain uh, people that will tell you, 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 you got to wait on your season. That I'm in my season now. When they're having a good time, they declare that they're in their season. When souls are being saved, people are joining the church. They declare, I'm in my season. But I want to let you know the Apostle Paul paints a picture tonight, and the picture that he paints is you are in your season even when there's opposition. <laughs> that you ought to be in your season even when there's opposition around you. Even when your life is being threatened, you ought to be in your season sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Some people couldn't live during this time. Some people were living the day they couldn't stand it during this time because they got to wait on their season. And if they're waiting on their season, they're going to wait on when it's a good time to share the gospel. In one of my teaching sessions of sharing the gospel, uh, early the early part, right after I had written the book, Sharing the Gospel, uh, people all over the city, all over the nation, they really wanted me to come share the sharing the gospel um, uh, book and sh the sharing the gospel presentation of evangelism. We had about 14 different teachers, 15 with myself, and we would go from church to church, neighborhood to neighborhood, call the local churches together in one setting, and we would share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would take them through an eight-week course, and they would graduate uh, through Turning Hearts Ministry. I mean, we were in our season, as they would say. And while we were in our season, I was sharing at a local church in Houston, and I told them how I led a guy to Christ in the restroom, in the restaurant. Kim Song Restaurant, right there off 288 and 59. I led a man to Christ, standing right there facing the wall. And as I gave my presentation, one lady raised her hand and said, wait a minute. Was that the right timing? Was that the right place? Huh. I asked her what you mean. She said, my pastor tells me that there's a time and a place for everything. So she challenged me, so I kind of loved the challenge. She said to me, that was not the time nor the place to share Jesus in the restroom. I said to her, well, you gossip in the restroom. You lie in the restroom. You talk bad about people in the restroom. You get in fights in the restroom. Why can't we share Christ in the restroom? We ought to be taking Christ everywhere we go. We ought to not only be, be saved by him, but we ought to serve him. We ought to share the gospel. We ought to be on a missionary journey every day. We ought to be telling people through evangelism about Jesus Christ. And not only should we tell them, we ought to minister to them by way of missions, giving them food, clothing, and shelter. I want to commend the great United States of America during this pandemic all over the world. You can see people in long lines needing food, but missionaries from Every walk of life, whether they were Christians or not, they were passing out food and, and making sure that little children ate. Children that were out of school, then some of those children only get food when they go to school. I want to commend the, 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 the superintendent that was acting during that time of Houston Independent School Di District. Dr. Lathan, thank you so much for developing a plan where these children can eat during this time. We ought to be about our mission journey. We ought to be servants. It says, says in the text that, that we sent Timothy. I sent Timothy 
our brother, meaning he's saved. Timothy, our brother, a minister of God, meaning that he's a servant of God. I said Timothy, who's also our fellow laborer in Jesus Christ. This fellow labor means that he, he was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. We labor in the gospel. We labor in the word of God. We spend time in the word in order that we would share it with others. My philosophy is you ought to spend 90% of your time reading, studying, meditating on the word of God when it comes to sharing the gospel. And you spend 10% of your time actually speaking the word and sharing the gospel. The problem with many people in the church is that they don't know what to share. They don't know what to carry. They don't know what to tell people because they haven't spent time in the word of God. When you spend 90% of your soul winning time in the word and praying and meditating and talking to God, when God opens the door, that 10% of the time you're on fire for him and you're ready to share. Every caller, every robocall, Every human being that you talk to, I mean, you want to get rid of robocallers? I'm not talking about the machines. You just hang up on them. But when there's a human voice, hello, this is Allie. When there's a human voice on the other end, after you have nicely told him or her that I don't want any, I don't want to sell my house. I don't, I don't want another contract. I don't want another warranty. No, I don't want to take a chance. And I don't want another vacation spot. After you have very nicely told them, then you engage them in the word of God. Engage them in a conversation that presents the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you engage them, they will either accept it or they will never call you again. If you want to get, a, get rid of, of all of these commercials and all these callers, just share the gospel. The Paul, Paul says, we are presenting, we are sending Timothy to you. Timothy is saved. He's my brother. Timothy is a servant. He's a minister of God. And then thirdly, he's a fellow laborer in the word. He's a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, meaning that he knows the word. That's why we have Bible study. That's how, why we have Sunday school. That's why we have discipleship for men and discipleship for women. We do it simply because people need to know the word of God. If you're going to be one who labor with me, you need to know the word. If you're going to be one who labors with members of your church, you need to know the word of God. That's why, that's why the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses have a field day with many of us because they know their word and we don't know our word. I mean, what does it look like you running from the Jehovah's Witnesses when they're at your door? You ought to meet them outside with your book in your hand if you have to and, and say, let's turn, let's turn the strip. Let's go from verse to verse. Let's go ahead and talk about it. But you can only do that if you know the word. Paul says, Timothy knows the word so much so until he's a co-laborer with me. He's a fellow laborer with me in the gospel of Christ. He says, I'm sending you Timothy. And this is the reason why I'm sending you Timothy. Look at verse number two. He says, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. He says, I'm sending Timothy to establish you. I'm sending Timothy to strengthen you. This word establish means to strengthen. This word establish is the same word we get the word steadfastness. In other words, we want to make sure that you're holding steadfastly to what you have been taught, to what you have been trained. That's why it's imperative to teach young girls and boys before they go off to college the word of God because a college campus is a field day for Satan. 
a college campus will turn a child's uh, faith level upside down. But if we teach them, encourage them, and establish them in the word of God, they can come back during that first break during Christmas time, still talking about Jesus. On a college campus, many of our young men turn to Muslim and Islam worship because they are not established. This word established means to strengthen. We send in Timothy to you to make you stable, to make you firmly planted in this place. This word established means to be firmly planted. The tree that sits by the brook, sits by the river of water, it is firmly established. It is firmly stable. It is firmly established. It is strengthened. It is there. Regardless of what the winds and the waves do, this tree may bend, but it will not break. And if it does break off the top, the roots are still in the ground. You got to know that our youth and our young people need to be firmly established. Firmly stable. Establish. It, it says, I sent Timothy to you uh, to, to make sure that you are still established, to establish you, to make you firm. Then he says, I, I sent him to encourage you. We all need to be encouraged. This word encourage means to be comfort. Word encourage means to be <laughs> inspired. This, this word encourage means to be exhorted. We ought to be those who exhort others in the word of God. We ought to be encouragers. We, he says, I'm sending Timothy uh, concerning your faith so you can be established in your faith, be solidly grounded. I'm sending Timothy concerning your faith so you can be encouraged, inspired in your faith. Let me tell you, when you hear negativity all day long, you need somebody to encourage you. <laughs> That's why wives and husbands, when your, your spouse comes home and talking to you about things that they've been going through every day, you ought to have an encouraging word for him and her. When your friend call you just to just to make sure that you know how their day has gone and how hectic it has been, you ought to have an encouraging word for them. Strengthen their faith. Encourage them in their faith. Apostle Paul said, I, I sent Timothy to you for the sole reason of making sure that you're hanging in there. Making sure that your faith is not wavering that your faith is not at a point where you're about to give up. During this pandemic, somebody's faith was about to give up, but somebody called them and said, be encouraged. Be encouraged in the Lord. Sometimes it only takes a text message. Sometimes it only takes a phone call. Sometimes it only takes an email just to say, be encouraged. Oftentimes when people are going through we try to find these lofty words to tell them. You don't need lofty words. Just be yourself. And sometimes encouragement is for you to be quiet. For you just to sit with them, spend time with them. Let them know that you're there for them. Encourage them in the faith. Verse number three, he says, I'm sending Timothy to you concerning your faith, that you can be established, that you can be encouraged, and, and that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. He doesn't want you shaken by these afflictions. He, he doesn't want you to be moved. He doesn't want you to turn away from God. Everybody needs to be encouraging each other in times like these, that they not be moved. This word moved, this word shaken means to, to be disturbed. Timothy coming to you. Every now and then we ought to have somebody come to us and we ought to go to somebody every now and then to encourage them, 
to not be disturbed by the trouble, to not be moved by, not be shaken by these afflictions. Don't be shaken by every little thing that happens to you. Sometimes we get shaken too quickly. The word affliction means trouble and tribulation. Anguish, trouble, tribulation, anguish. Don't be so easily shaken by every little thing that happens. Don't be so easily removed or moved by everything that goes on. Your faith has to remain strong during these times. Your faith have to be unmoved during this time. There's trouble in this life of Christianity. There will be trouble. The apostle Paul says tonight that there's going to be trouble. Jesus says in John 6 and 33 that the world offers you tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, John 16 and 33. John, I stand corrected. John 16 and 33 says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The world will offer you tribulations. The world will offer you issues. The world will offer you problems. But be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. These are, Paul says, these are light afflictions. Verse number three, he continues by saying, for you yourself know that we are appointed to this. You, your, you know yourself. Some people use the word call. We are appointed. We, are, we, are, we have laid down our lives for such things. This word appointed means that, that we have laid up all that we've learned for such a time like this. God has called you. God has called you in a manner right here and right now. God has called you for such a time as this, during these tribulations, during these hardships, during these suffering moments, God has called you. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be a bishop. You don't have to be a deacon. God has called you if you're saved. If you're saved, you ought to be telling somebody about Jesus. You ought to be encouraging them. You ought to be encouraging them in such a way that Jesus, the Christ, will flow from your lips with ease. Paul says we will call for this. We have been laid up for this. Matter of fact, he says that our afflictions has led us to this point. Verse number four, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulations just as it happened and you know. Paul said, don't act like you surprised now. <laughs> don't act like you are astonished. We told you about these afflictions. We told you that it was going to happen. We told you it was coming. We told you that this very thing would take place. We told you when you get into this gospel ministry, when you get saved, things will happen differently and there will be great opposition. Things will happen. I mean, the things that uh, that's going on in just our nation alone, things are happening all around us. We need to understand very clearly that this is not a cakewalk because you got saved. This is not a walk in the park because you got saved. You just did, somebody fool you like you were signing up to walk on a bed of ease. This Christian walk calls for opposition. We ought to be prepared for opposition. Paul has told us, Jesus has told us, I'm telling you. Some preachers will tell you, I am naming it and I'm claiming it. You can name and claim whatever you want to name and claim. You're going to have some problems. In this life, there will be some issues. Paul says, for in fact, we told you before we were with you 
when we were with you. When we were in your presence, we told you. We told you before when we were with you that you will suffer some tribulations. We told you before when we were with you that this will happen and it's happening. And you know it was, you knew it was going to happen and you see it happening now. He addressed, addressed several issues here. Number one, you're going to have tribulation. Number two, we told you we were going to have tribulation. Number three, you knew we were going to have tribulations. Number four, the tribulation have, has arrived. It's on the doorstep. It's in the house. It's at the kitchen table. Tribulation is present. Tribulation eats with you. <laughs> Tribulation, like some, some sing the song, he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me that I am his own. That's true, but the reverse is as true. Tribulation walks with you. Tribulation talks with you. And tribulation tries to make you its own. Paul says that tribulation, just as it has happened, is present with you. It's here. Just as it happened, and you know it. The other thing he addresses here when he says, and you know, there are some people who are still in the clouds. They don't want to accept the fact that trouble is coming. They don't want to accept the fact. They, they say stuff like, no, that ain't going to happen to me. Well, just keep living. <laughs> They say something to the effect that I rebuke it and you can rebuke it as long as you want to. <laughs> trouble is coming. You're either headed for trouble, you're either coming out of trouble, or you're in the middle of trouble right now. The good news is trouble doesn't last always. Yeah, there are people who choose to stick their heads in the sand, exposing the rest of them, and act like trouble is not for them. Our trouble won't take place. If it's not sickness, it's a low income. If it's not a low income, it's a, it's a, it's, it's gas shortage. If it's not gas shortage, it's a coronavirus. If it's not the coronavirus, it's the Republicans acting crazy. If it's not the Republicans, it's the independents. If it's not the independents, then it's the Democrats. Let me tell you, trouble is here and we know it. You got to accept the fact. Trouble is here just as it happened. Verse number five, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith. That doesn't read well, but what he's saying here is, I sent Timothy to know your faith. He says, I sent, this is a new King James version, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter, Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the, the accuser of the brethren. Lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Paul says all the work we've done, all the distance we've covered, all the things we've been through, all the ministry we've taken you through, all the word that you have learned, I am sending Timothy to you. I sent Timothy to you because he was there, he's there to strengthen your faith. He's there to encourage you. He is there to establish your faith. There ought to be somebody. There ought to be somebody that we can send to help the people to be encouraged. That would be somebody. The, the sad summation today is that the pastor may not be able to send the associate minister because the associate minister has a clear understanding of what needs to happen, but he has ulterior motives. I've had my share of those. I've had associate ministers that, that I call now Alexander the Coffin Smith. Alexander the carpetsmith, Paul says, mark that man. Alexander the carpetsmith has done me great harm in ministry. I've had several of them. I, I can't count them on two hands. 
I've had several associates that I could not send to encourage people because they had arterial motives. The Bible says, mark that man. That means tell folk about them. Don't give them a good recommendation. It says, mark them. He says, remember now Alexander the carpet smith. Alexander the carpet smith did me great harm in ministry. That's what Paul says. See, today we don't talk like Paul and Jesus talk. We talk this pretty talk. We want to bless everybody. We want to befriend everybody. We want to love on everybody. And we just want to sing kumbaya and everybody's happy. But Paul doesn't see it that way. He points out those who are good. He points out those who are good for the ministry. And then he warns us about those who are not good. He says the tempter, the tempter, the tempter, the devil himself. The devil is a hitchhiker. Paul says, I'm sending my associate minister. He's saved. He's a servant. He's a, he's a fellow yokeman. He's a fellow laborer in the gospel. I'm sending him. What Paul does, he gives Timothy a great recommendation. He, he adds credibility to him. Paul, he says, Paul says, I'm sending Timothy so he can establish you. He can build up your faith. And he, he said, I'm, I'm doing this because I am in fear that the tempter is about to get to you. And if the tempter get to you, all the work we've done is in vain. He said, I'm trying to make sure that I don't have to go back and cover the basics anymore. I do say to you, there are many in the church today who really need to go back through the basics. Salvation, sanctification, glorification. Go back through the basics, justification. Go back through the basics that, that God wants, wants God is in your life. Once you're saved, you're always saved. We need to go back through the basics because there are those who think that they got something high and mighty better than we have. Just get Jesus and Jesus alone. If you get Jesus, he will walk with you. He will talk with you. And he will tell you that he is and you are his own. You just need Jesus. You, you you don't need to get another prayer line and and talk about uh, talk about getting filled with the Holy Spirit when you are saved. The Holy Spirit comes in right there with you. He comes in and he resides with you. The Holy Spirit, He, the third person of the Triune God, the Holy Spirit shows up when Jesus shows up. You don't have to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you may need to activate him because you made him lay dormant. You have not accepted his leadership when you are saved and know that you're saved. But for some reason or the other, you're not abiding by the Holy Spirit leadership. Then you may need to go ahead and rededicate, recommit. And that brings me to the invitation. If you're not saved you need to be saved. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, this is your moment. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Your faith can only be built up once you're saved. It takes the word of God to save us through Jesus Christ. We need to know the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you and he died for me. The door is open. This is your moment. You can receive Jesus right here, right now. The door is open. The invitation is given. Will you trust him today? Will you trust what Jesus has done over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary? Will you trust how, how mean men killed him? Will you trust that Jesus died a sinner's death as an innocent man? Will, will you trust the fact that, that over 2,000 years ago, he gave voluntarily gave his, his life? They killed him on the cross, took him off the cross, 
laid him in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he rose from the dead. If you can trust this simple story today, you can be born again. Just repeat after me. If you would, just bow your head and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you was buried. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer, believing the story that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead, that he's truly the Son of God, we believe that you're going to heaven when you die. There may be others of you who are saved. As Timothy, you are saved, but you not as Timothy or a servant. This is your moment. You may have fallen out with the preacher, fallen out with the church, fallen out with the church member, and for some reason you're not walking with him. I say to you, you need to repent. You need to recommit. You need to rededicate. You, you need to get back right with God. If you're out of church, you need to be in church. If you don't have a church home, you need a church home. Will you pray with me? I want to pray that you recommit, rededicate, repent. Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I come now. I pray for those who have fallen short, those who have, have constantly walked away from you. Lord, I pray, Father God, that you accept them back and that you, you guide them and lead them by the reins of their hearts and their minds that you draw them back to you. Your Lord, Lord, your word says that your Holy Spirit will draw us. I pray that you draw them now. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church right here in Southeast Houston. Please be a member of our church. Please join us on Sunday morning. Please thank you for joining us tonight for our Wednesday night service. And if you want a good church, where the word of God is being taught and practiced, I recommend you join the New Beginning Church. Whether you are locally located or globally located, we welcome you to join the New Beginning Church. Please inbox me and let me know that you want to be a member. You can be a member of the New Beginning Church. Now we are broadcasting as we have done for many years. We are broadcasting even the more so. And we want you to be a part of the New Beginning Church. Please come and inbox me and let me know you want to be a part. If you've received Christ or you've rededicated your life to Christ tonight, please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, come and inbox me and let me know so I can celebrate with you and, and glorify God's name with you. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. And you can give to the New Beginning Church. You can give to the New Beginning Church in one or two ways. You can give by way. You can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is, as we lift Jesus, he draw all men unto himself. The second way you can give is by mail. You can mail your, your tithes and offering in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for being here for our Bible study at 7.15 p.m. every Wednesday night. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. 
and also for our worship service at 9.30 a.m. I'm sorry, 10.30 a.m. every Sunday, 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. Thank you for being a part to our business. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. To our members, thank you for being a part and thank you for following the New Beginning Church here on this broadcast. As we close out tonight in prayer, we want to remember Shirley Bentley and Lorene Orr. We want to pray for them continually, and we praise God for what he has already done. We thank God for what he's doing through them and through their bodies and how he's showing himself faithful. And also, we are adding to our prayer list tonight uh, Mary Williams. We want to pray for Mary Williams as well as Randy Towns. Thank God for, for what he is what he has done and what he is going to do. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for those who we mention and those who we may not have mentioned. We ask you to bless in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come before you and we end this broadcast and this Bible study. We ask you, Father God, to bless every person to know that they are encouragers. Bless every person to be encouraged by way of the word of God. Strengthen our faith in times like these. Bless us to study your word, that your word will become real to us. And Lord, we ask you to bless us as we go, that we would tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion, until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Thank you for joining us here tonight. God bless you.